Hello everyone! In today's video, I'm going to be answering many, many questions posed by you, our audience. Welcome back to the Living Well with Schizophrenia channel. My name is Lauren and I make videos about what it's like to live with schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia. If you would like to see more videos like this one, make sure to subscribe to our channel so as not to miss anything we put out. And also, if you would like to help support the creation of future videos like this one, please make sure to check out the link to our Patreon page, which is in the description below. All right, so about a week ago or so, we put it out to you, our audience, to pose us any questions you wanted to know the answer to um, through our Instagram page or we also looked at some questions that you posed on our community section of our YouTube channel. And you guys came up with some really, really wonderful questions and I wish that we had time to address all of them, but unfortunately I just don't have time. But hopefully we've picked out some questions that will be helpful to a large number of people. And also we, we thought that some of the questions might be better addressed in their own video. So if your question isn't answered, I'm sorry, um, maybe, maybe keep waiting for a video to come out about your question and hopefully the answers to the questions that we do get to today are of use. All right, so the first question that I have is does schizoaffective disorder influence your life on a daily basis or are there some maybe rare days when you feel like it doesn't affect you at all? I think because I have gotten to a place where I'm able to manage my schizoaffective disorder quite well through medication and through other kind of psychosocial interventions and whatnot, there are definitely days where I, you know, maybe almost forget that I even have it because I'm not bombarded with symptoms continuously throughout the day. And so, you know, it definitely comes in ebbs and flows in terms of the intensity and severity of my symptoms. But um, I definitely do have days where I am fairly symptom free and, you know, feel like I am living my life normally, not impacted by symptoms. Now, that's not taking into account, you know, the various other aspects of the illness, such as side effects of medications that come from treating it and reducing these symptoms. And so, you know, there's there's kind of always some reminder that I have schizoaffective disorder, whether it's actual symptoms or whether it's side effects of meds or whatnot, or whether it's just grappling with the idea of taking meds or anything like that. But generally, I think that, you know, the root of this question is that, you know, it is possible to live your life in a way where it doesn't take over your life. Okay, the next question. What are some ways family members can support and guide someone who doesn't accept the reality of their mental illness and refuses medication? Um, so we have a video out about this for how to support a loved one who is um, not wanting to take medication or who is not taking medication. So make sure to check that one out. But just to quickly summarize, I think what's best is to be as open and have as much communication with them as possible. So make sure that you are facilitating dialogue with your loved one about, you know, the difficulties in their life that you are noticing and how you feel that medication or other forms of interventions may help them to manage those those symptoms and just making sure you are you know coming at it from a really supportive loving place and just offering support and offering to have those conversations as often as you can how do you talk to your children about the illness and how do you shield them from the difficult moments so that is something that we also want to cover more in future videos is how to talk to kids about mental illness and about schizophrenia and whatnot. And that is something that we are currently navigating. Um, our kids are eight and five. And so we have started having conversations. They know that I have, or they know that I have schizophrenia. They don't know schizoaffective disorder and all the intricacies of the language around that, but they understand that I, mom, have a mental illness. Um, and so we're learning how to talk more about, you know, what exactly that means and what my mental illness looks like and what that means for them and kind of getting into that a little bit more as they get older. Um, in terms of shielding them from the difficult moments, you know, we are very fortunate that, so our two kids are from a previous relationship of Rob's. And so we have another set of parents that we co-parent with. So when things are getting difficult or hard, or we notice that things are kind of heading in a not great direction, we make sure that the kids are with their other set of parents so as to you know, protect them as much as possible from seeing something that could potentially be traumatic. And so we're very lucky in that regard. That may be a little bit harder with this one on the way because we are its only set of parents. And so... I think what's going to happen or what we're going to need to do is still continue to lean on supports, whether it's, you know, friends or family or whatnot to be able to help us 
keep or help us protect our child as much as possible in terms of what they're exposed to. Um, and also, you know, just not to put a lot of pressure on myself, but, you know, knowing that I am responsible for these children is a bit of a protective factor in that it encourages me to keep taking my medications and to keep trying to be as healthy as possible. Now that said, relapses happen, you know, you can be doing everything right and a relapse can still happen. So when that happens, just making sure that we are leaning on family and friends supports and making sure that we are communicating with our kids as much as possible to, to let them know what's going on to a degree that they can understand and not be fearful or, you know, traumatized by the situation, but definitely keeping them involved in terms of talking to them about what's going on. Have you ever been misdiagnosed with something and how did you know what the right diagnosis was? Um, so yes, I was first diagnosed with depression and then I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder two or one, I don't know, whatever. And then I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder one with psychotic features. And then I was finally diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. When treating each of those illnesses, the treatments did never really quite fit or never really quite worked. And also the diagnosis itself never really completely fit my symptoms and whatnot. And, you know, things kept coming up that made the diagnosis not quite fit right until the diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder came along. And that just seemed to really encompass my symptoms and encompass the experiences that I was having. And also the treatment for that finally stuck and was more effective. So there was definitely a process of misdiagnoses that I had to go through to get to my diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. But once I got that diagnosis, it just felt like a good fit. What helps you to continue trusting your mental health professionals when you're going through a rough patch? Um, so this is definitely something that I grapple with in terms of um, delusions around mental health professionals and whatnot trying to harm me or, you know, being against me in some way. And so what has really helped with this is working on building trust and connection with my mental health care team when things are stable and when things are going well so that I can kind of fall back on that trust that has been built when my brain is telling me to not trust these people and to be afraid of them and that kind of thing. And just having that that groundwork laid in terms of building a relationship, a trusting relationship with these people has been huge. How do you get someone to seek treatment when they're not at risk to themselves and truly don't believe they're unwell and flat out refuse? Um, so there's a couple different layers to this question. So first of all, I want to address that if they're not a harm to themselves, you really shouldn't be forcing them to get treatment. It's their decision, ultimately. It's their choice. And if they're not a harm to themselves or to someone else, you can't make someone receive treatment. Um, so what can you do? Um, really just offer as much as much communication with them as you as you can and as they're willing to receive in terms of talking about the things that you're noticing if they don't think that anything's going on, talking about the things that you feel they might be struggling with and maybe bringing up some things that you feel might help that and just opening up those conversations more and more and really coming at it from a very supportive, loving, empathetic place because chances are they're probably pretty scared about what's going on and the system and whatnot. And so just really trying to understand where they're coming from in their resistance to treatment is 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 probably the most helpful thing you can do in terms of building that empathy and building trust. Do you also get intrusive thoughts and how are they different from voices? Um, so this is something that I've been noticing a lot in the comments, especially on the schizophrenia simulation video where people are saying, oh, I get that all the time. It's just my own internal dialogue, or I get those intrusive thoughts all the time. That's normal. That's, I must have schizophrenia or you like that's, you know, whatever, kind of misconstruing what the experience of voices are like. And I want to make the differentiation that that intrusive thoughts and your own internal dialogue are very different from voices that someone may hallucinate. Intrusive thoughts are thoughts that maybe don't feel like they're your own, that pop into your head, but they are your own thoughts and they are within your own internal dialogue, you know. But voices that someone may hallucinate are you know, not their, not their own thoughts as well, but they are very distinguishable in terms of coming from another source that is not inside your head. It can be inside your head, but it's a voice from someone else, not your own voice. And it's an audible voice that you hear 
either from around you or coming from inside your head that is very different from from intrusive thoughts that someone might have. Intrusive thoughts can be part of um, schizophrenia as well, as well as other mental illnesses too. And so um, that can be part of things, but they are different. There is a difference between intrusive thoughts and hallucinations such as voices. What is your opinion on the hearing voices movement? Okay, um, hearing voices movement. So the, for those who don't know, the hearing voices movement is kind of like an anti-psychiatry um, group, organization, movement um, that is wanting to kind of dismiss psychiatric interventions when it comes to schizophrenia and hearing voices and psychosis and whatnot. And so my stance on hearing the hearing voices movement is that I think the the root idea of it is a good one in terms of being around building self-acceptance in people who hear voices, in people who have schizophrenia or psychosis and whatnot. And I think that there is a lot of valuable work in terms of people coming to a place of acceptance of their experience of this mental illness. However, there is a great, great deal of harm in how they're going about that and in the stance that they are taking on what schizophrenia is or what hearing voices is and psychiatry's role in treating that. There is a lot of scientific evidence that schizophrenia is a brain illness, a brain disease, a brain disorder, and that there is physiological things that aren't quite going normally within the brain. And you know, there's great, great stuff happening in terms of the neurodivergence movement and whatnot, and seeing brain differences as not so much of a deficit, but more as just a difference. And, you know, I understand this and I agree with this, but where this becomes a problem is that for a lot of people who experience hearing voices or experience psychosis or schizophrenia, the symptoms that they're experiencing are causing a great deal of distress, either to themselves or to the people around them, but primarily to themselves. And so, you know, I think it's important to, to understand that that is not just a difference in someone's being, you know, that's not just embracing differences in terms of embracing schizophrenia and not treating it. I think that, you know, it's important to understand that it causes distress in people's lives. And so it's important to treat it. And, you know, saying things like hearing voices is a gift or is just a difference in someone is, is very harmful. And it's basically the same thing as saying, oh, this person is having a heart attack, but it's just a difference or it's just a gift in their heart. You know, their heart is just, it's not, it's not faulty. It's not, um, you know, an illness or anything. It's just a difference in this person. And you can't say that. You need to treat the the heart condition that this person is experiencing. And so I think it's the same with, with schizophrenia or hearing voices in that there is room to come to a place of acceptance around the illness and reduce stigma around the illness. And I think that that's something that they're working on, but, but the harm comes in when they completely dismiss any psychiatric interventions or treatments. Have you ever had to be involuntarily committed? If so, how was your experience and what is your stance on being involuntarily committed? Um, <laughs> Every single one of my hospital experiences have been involuntary, unfortunately. It has caused me a lot of distress in my life being involuntarily committed. And I think it's it's very important to understand the level of power that that gives people over other people's lives in terms of being able to hold them against their will. Um, that said, there's a lot of layers here. Because, you know, severe mental illnesses that involve things like anosognosia, it's very easy for a person to be, in, be at risk to themselves or to other people and just have no idea, no idea that they're ill and need treatment. And so I understand why there is involuntary commitment. I do want to discuss this more in depth. And so we will probably do a video on involuntary commitment, but mixed feelings. <laughs> I understand the need for it, but it is very hard to be involuntarily committed. Are there any movies you feel portray schizophrenia really well? 
Um, so I haven't seen all the movies that I would like to see that portray schizophrenia. Most of the movies that I have seen are not very good. <laughs> we did a review on um, a new movie, Words on Bathroom Walls, and that was, I, I didn't like that movie. You can watch that review over on that video. We also were going to do a review of Eternal Beauty, which is a new one that just came out as well. And we couldn't even make it through the, the movie. Like we had to turn it off halfway through because it was so, so horribly stigmatizing and awful. And so I'm not, I'm not in a, in an optimistic place when it comes to portray the portrayal of schizophrenia in media and movies and whatnot. However, there is one that I do want to mention. There was a mini series that came out on Netflix about a year or so ago, maybe a little over a year, a couple years ago, called Maniac. And it starred Jonah Hill and Emma Stone. And it did, Jonah Hill in the, in the series has schizophrenia. And they do a wonderful job of portraying his experience with schizophrenia and also making sure to not make it the focal point of his character. You know, he was a well-developed character beyond his schizophrenia. And it was also really interesting that they kind of, the way they did this series, they kind of brought Emma Stone's character and some other characters into the experience of psychosis as well. And so that was really interesting to see how they kind of went a step further in terms of portraying, you know, what psychosis is like or, you know, what it's like to go through these things. And so I think that that is worthy of checking out. I really enjoyed that series for a multitude of reasons, but also because they did a good job, I think, of portraying schizophrenia with Jonah Hill's character. Has schizophrenia held you back in pursuing the career of your dreams? <laughs> yes. Yes, it has. Um, there's not a lot I can say about that. You know, it's unfortunate and I wish that it wasn't a reality, but I was on, you know, a career path that is different from where I'm at right now. And it was what I wanted and it, maybe it is still what I want, you know, further down the road, but there have been various points in my illness that have impeded the progress in terms of pursuing that goal and impeded progress in terms of pursuing those career aspirations. And so I would love to be like, no, my my illness hasn't held me back in any regard, but unfortunately the reality is that it has. I think I'm still working on how to integrate my illness with my life and how to make room for everything, including my aspirations, my career aspirations and that kind of thing. But I think that the process of opening myself up to understanding the limitations I may have or the extra skills I may have as a result of my mental illness and learning how to incorporate those into a career that works for me and is a good fit for me is something that I am learning at the moment. And so, you know, I, I don't want to just paint this bleak picture that I have failed in terms of obtaining my career aspirations because of my illness when, you know, my, my illness has opened me up to other possibilities that I never would have dreamt of that I also enjoy. And so, you know, I think it's really, regardless of if you have an illness or not, life is just kind of about learning your own skills and limitations and learning how to work within those to live a meaningful and happy life for yourself. Do you believe in God and how can people with schizophrenia navigate their faith when delusions can often be religious in nature? Whew, uh, so that's a really great question. No, I don't believe in God. I, I don't identify as a religious person. There was a period in my illness when things were starting to flare up early on that I I did become more, more spiritual and religious and I got really kind of obsessed with um, researching different branches of religion. So I understand that side of schizophrenia in terms of delusions and whatnot being religious in nature. And, you know, this is a hard question for me to answer because I don't myself identify as religious. And so I don't have personal experience trying to differentiate between my own spirituality and my delusions. And so I really don't want to offend anyone. I have a lot of respect for people who do identify as more spiritual and religious. I know that that can be a really grounding thing for some people. And so I guess what I would encourage you to do if you are having troubles kind of drawing this line between delusions, religious delusions, and, you know, real spirituality is to borrow some of the skills that you 
that you have around, you know, reality checking and fact checking for other kinds of delusions. And, you know, that may be hard because, you know, religion is not is not really fact-based or evidence-based. It's kind of an abstract thing and a, an individual relationship that someone has, you know, with their own spirituality. So I get how that can be hard. So it may be helpful to have some kind of a spiritual mentor, someone who you really trust and who knows about your illness and your your susceptibility to delusions, religious delusions, that you can kind of talk through some of these poss- potential delusions with and really talk through you know, what is what is helpful constructive spirituality and what is more of a destructive delusion? <laughs> what do you order at cafes? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't really have a regular order, but I guess I would say Americanos, black. <laughs> what are your favorite bands and writers? Um, so I think my favorite musician is probably Gregory Allen Isakov. Um, I'm really into the Bahamas new stuff right now and guilty pleasure is Taylor Swift. Uh, her new two like folk albums I have been kind of binging on since, since like July, I think is when they came out. And I was in the top 2% of Taylor Swift listeners on, um, on Spotify this year. (laughs) So guilty pleasure. Writers, I think my favorite writer is probably Sylvia Plath. My favorite book is probably The Bell Jar, or I also really like Louisa May Alcott's writing. She did like Little Women and all the, that whole series. What is your favorite dog breed? Um, hands down, Wheat and Terrier Poodles. What is the perfect gift to give schizophrenics? <laughs> what? Like, what? We're not like this like specific group of people who all like the same thing. Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. Give me some specifics about the schizophrenic in your life. You know, like they're people. They have different interests and stuff. You can't just ask what schizophrenics would like as a gift. Also, schizophrenic is a little bit offensive. People with schizophrenia. Next question. How did you meet your husband? Uh, uh, Tinder. Next question. How do you find inspiration and creativity to create new YouTube videos while managing your schizoaffective disorder? Great question. It's actually very, very hard. (laughs) There are times where I feel very, very inspired and, you know, work well with Rob to come up with new content and things just click. Or, you know, I'm able to film a video with ease and things just click. But there are the vast majority of time where it is not that easy. And I struggle with things like motivation and things like you know, abstract thought around coming up with new concepts to talk about and creativity around videos and whatnot. So I am very fortunate that I have Rob in my life as a partner with this whole channel to kind of give me that kick in the pants to keep working at it and to bounce ideas off of. And, you know, he kind of drags me along sometimes and I think I need that. (laughs) It is very hard to muster up motivation and, you know, keep creativity alive. Like, I think that part of the illness is kind of ebbs and flows in terms of your ability to do that. But then when you add on like treating it with medication and whatnot too, which kind of slows you down, it's hard. It's very hard. So if you are struggling with motivation, you are not alone. I too struggle with that. What helps me personally is to have people in my life who keep me accountable and keep me motivated and keep keep me going. How can people who don't live with a disorder help with the stigma? Um, great question. I think a lot of people are getting more and more interested in terms of um, mental health advocacy and reducing stigma and whatnot. And, you know, that includes people who don't have the illness or don't have any mental illness. And so, you know, I think there's been this push to share stories and be vulnerable in that regard. But there's so much more that you can do, too, in terms of being an advocate and being an ally in terms of reducing stigma around mental illness. And I think the very first thing that you can do is really work to educate yourself about mental illness and about the stigma that permeates society around mental illnesses. And then once you feel grounded in having enough knowledge about that, you can work to educate other people and to open up conversations about mental illnesses such as schizophrenia with other people in an effort to further reduce stigma. Why do you use the term schizophrenia and schizoaffective disorder interchangeably? Um, okay, so I try not to. I, I try not to use them interchangeably. I try to specify like schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia. Sometimes I just use schizophrenia as a bit of a blanket term because there is a spectrum 
in terms of psychosis-related disorders. Um, And schizoaffective disorder, part of it is schizophrenia and also a mood disorder. And so when I am talking about the schizophrenia symptoms, the umbrella of symptoms that that includes, I just say schizophrenia to simplify the explanation in terms of constantly talking about one or the other, because there are a lot of different psychosis-related illnesses and symptoms that fall under the blanket term that I use of schizophrenia. How did you develop insight into your illness or what made you accept it? Um, I wouldn't say I'm there. (laughs) I wouldn't say I'm at a point of complete insight into my illness and complete acceptance. I think that it's as cliche as it sounds, it's very much an ongoing journey and something that I'm going to be going through for my whole life. And so I feel good about where I'm at on that journey in terms of the work that I've put into being compassionate with myself and understanding that I have this illness and that it's going to play a role in my life, but it's kind of it's kind of up to me how I look at it and how I choose to interpret what it means for my life. And you know, taking ownership over taking ownership over my illness really and choosing how I want to manage it, choosing my own goals for that I want for life and working towards those goals myself and with my support team and my medical support team. And yeah, that's that's kind of where I'm at in terms of the journey. And I think that, you know, with this illness, self-acceptance and illness insight is never going to be a point that you completely reach. I think that it's just inherent in terms of what this illness is to to make you question that every now and then and to have you grapple with that every now and then. And that's just part of it. And it's something that you need to continuously work on. I think what was kind of a turning point for me was understanding that my diagnosis and living with schizoaffective disorder is not a death sentence. You know, like there are definitely some struggles and challenges that are going to come with living with an illness like that. However, it is very much still possible to lead a meaningful, productive, full, happy life with it. And I think that a lot of people don't fully understand that. They don't fully understand that, yeah, your life may look different and you may have different challenges, but you can still derive a lot of meaning and a lot of fulfillment from your life, even if you happen to also live with an illness such as schizophrenia. How can I be supportive, but still keep boundaries in relation to people who are refusing help and medication? Um, So I think that this is a really important, important question because, you know, I wish that I could have Rob come and answer this too, because I think that it's important to hear from someone who is supporting someone with this illness in terms of how to really, really maintain boundaries while still being supportive. I know that that is a very, very challenging thing. Just watching Rob support me through the difficult times, I know that it plays a tremendous toll on him. And I know that there is a very, very hard to to, to decipher line between, you know, how much support and love to pour into someone without completely depleting yourself and completely crossing boundaries that diminish your own well-being. And so I know that that is a very tricky line, and I think it's going to be really up to each individual to draw that line out for yourself. And I think what's important here is to work on communicating that line with your loved one. So, you know, working on pouring as much support and love into them as you can, but really communicating where your boundaries are to that person and communicating that you want to support them fully. But if if you do this for them or if you go further than this, it's going to be harmful to yourself. And so you can't cross that line. And I think, you know, communicating that with that person will help bring them towards that line, to meet you at that line in terms of accepting help, hopefully, and understanding that they need to support you through this too, or that not necessarily that, but that, that they need to respect you in this situation too, and respect your boundaries. And, you know, boundaries are a tricky thing to navigate because I think that there is some fluctuation in terms of where boundaries lie, whether it's, 
you know, on a normal basis or whether there's a crisis or, you know, there's, there's reasons why boundaries might fluctuate or change. And so I think what's really helpful also is for support people to be going to therapy, to work on identifying where their boundaries lie with a therapist and to really work on how to maintain those boundaries with your loved one. What are everyday stabilizing factors in your life? What is something important you think people underestimate or undervalue? So I think that everyday stabilizing factors in my life are primarily the people who I live with, the people who I interact with on a daily basis. They are very, you know, grounding and stabilizing forces in my life and also sometimes very chaotic forces. Anyone who has a five and eight year old will attest to that. However, you know, being surrounded by people who love me and people who I love is definitely a grounding force for me. Also, um, being active, you know, running in particular, running in nature, in the trails and whatnot is a very grounding thing for me and something that is a very, very useful tool in terms of maintaining stability for me. Something that I think people undervalue or maybe underestimate the importance of is really basic things like sleep. Sleep is hugely, hugely, hugely important um, for for anyone really, but especially if you're living and managing, living with and managing a mental illness like schizophrenia, I think that is very important to, you know, have that recovery period for your brain and have that regular routine for your brain in terms of how much sleep you're getting. Another thing that I think that people often overlook, and I know that I definitely overlook or have overlooked in the past, is the effect that stress can have on your mental stability and your mental wellness. Um, Stress, I know for me, is definitely a a major trigger when it comes to falling into psychosis and um, increased symptoms and whatnot. And so learning how to mitigate stress in my life is definitely something that I have learned the importance of, or am learning the importance of. I'm still not great at it, but it's something that I'm understanding more and more is a really important thing to consider. All right, so thank you so, so much to everyone who submitted a question for this video. We really appreciate um, engaging with you in this way. I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your question. There were so, so many good ones, really great questions that we wanted to get to, but just couldn't because of time. We are combing through the list for future video ideas. So if your question wasn't answered, we might be doing a separate video on it in the future as well. I also just wanted to make a quick mention about a type of comment that we saw come up repeatedly where people were you know, seemingly at their wits end and desperate for advice in terms of their specific situation. And that was what was coming up was that they were providing very specific details about their own situation that I couldn't really answer in this video because they were so specific to that person's situation. And so to those people, I'm really sorry that I couldn't get to your specific um, problem or thing that you were asking advice for. But what I really want to encourage you to do is to seek out support and help for yourself. Um, so namely, what I'm getting at here is therapy for yourself, someone who you can talk to about this specific situation who is going to be able to offer more guidance than I can provide about, you know, how to manage um, what to do with a loved one or how to manage family members or whatever your specific situation may be. I really want to encourage you to not lose hope and to to support yourself through whatever it is that you're going through. And a big way to do that is through therapy. I hope you found parts of this video or the whole video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and also make sure to subscribe so as not to miss any future content. Also, just another reminder that if you would like to help support the creation of future videos like this one, please make sure to check out the link to our Patreon page. It's in the description below. Any support you can provide is really, really appreciated. Thank you. So thanks so much again for watching this video. And as always, wishing you and your loved ones good health. See you in the next video. Bye.